Shalom, brothers and sisters, and welcome to this week's Sabbath service. We're going to start off by reading scripture, and this is from Ephesians 4, 11 through 14. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. For prayer requests and announcements, I want to start off by, I guess, distilling any fears. I had some people reach out to me after last week's message and ask me if I was okay. And I am going to tell you that I am okay, but I do have type 2 diabetes. Uh, it is genetic. No matter how much I eat, how much weight I lose, according to my doctor, it's probably not going to go away. And so because of that, I have to take a shot. And yes, I know this is personal, but just to let you guys know what's up. Um, when I take this shot, it makes me feel very sick. I mean, I just wonder if I'm going to die. And... I was taking it on Fridays, and that meant that by the time I was recording these services, I was at the height of that medicine kicking in, and the way it works is like I feel like garbage, and then as it goes by, I get to the point where I start feeling normal again, and then I have to take the shot, and it all starts over. So I talked to my doctor, we pushed it back, and I'm going to be taking the shot on Sundays now, so that hopefully I can have a little bit more time with my family. Uh, and the ability to record this, these services without feeling like garbage. And I'm, then, you know, it'll be a little bit of Sunday and a little bit while I'm at work where I won't feel well, but, I mean, that's just how it's going to be. She says she, she's trying, the goal is to try to get me off the medicine, and I hope that's possible. I could definitely use your prayers. But, yeah, all of that makes me very lethargic, makes me not really want to do anything, and so it makes it a little difficult for me to get the work done. So am I okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Am I okay? No, not really. But I am moving forward. I am getting this done to the best of my ability. And I would appreciate your prayers so that the Lord will help heal my body if possible. If well, when I say impossible, I know it's possible if it's his will to do so. And I also want to make sure that I continue having the strength to push forward and get this work done because this work is important. That said, it, this is one of the reasons why it's so important that we get me off of these Sabbath service videos. We really need to get, it's, we have a committee of people and I appreciate all of them. And we need to get some people that are willing and able to be recorded so that some other people can take over these Sabbath services, as I mentioned in the past, because there's a lot of work to do and, and I can't get it all done by myself. And I do appreciate the help that I'm receiving. I really do. This is a large work. There's, there's a lot to do. And everyone's doing a little bit. And the more hands we have, the lighter the load will be. So if you feel called to just be here, I really appreciate that. We really appreciate that because, it, you know, it, it means that we are doing what the Lord asked us to do. And if it's edifying you, then that means that, that everything's falling in place the way that God wants same time, if you feel called to be more active, whether in the background or in the foreground, please don't hesitate to reach out. We have several committees going now, which leads me to the next part of the announcements, and that is that we are currently, as a temple committee, looking at purchasing land. And so we have a brother that's willing to match funds with those that give, so we need, we need money, obviously, to buy the land. Uh, it looks like that's not going to be necessarily a problem if everything works out and where we're looking at. But once we have the land, what are we going to do with it? We can't buy the land unless we know that we're going to be able to care for the land. We're not going to buy it just to sit on it and let it go bad. So we need the financial resources and the people that would be able to 
help with this project. And that can be just as simple as setting up five to twenty dollars. You know, a full tithe is ten percent, whatever you feel like that is for you, whatever that means to you. And I will tell you that if we don't get enough money coming in from the other places that we need it, you know, for general resources, I've been paying things out of pocket, but we do have to dip into the, the, the temple fund because we have to make sure that this can this work can continue going. And the idea is that as more people don't donate, we'll be able to put that money back in. But we can't just sit on funds and go bankrupt. It doesn't make any sense. So it seems to me that right now, what's important to all of you are the things that you're paying for. So if you feel like the Holy Spirit's telling you that this temple is important, then please give to the temple fund. At the same time, please also don't neglect the general fund. And if you give money to the general fund, I will tell you that that money will get pushed into the temple fund as that becomes the greater focus. So we need your help. We need your help by showing up, being here. We need your help by participation, and we need your financial help so that we can move forward. We are also looking at, we've, we've submitted paperwork to join a universalist Christian group. Um, it's more like just an outreach so that we can let other Christians know that we're here and that if they're looking for the Book of Mormon in, in their services, then, then we're available. If they're looking for temple rituals, things like that. You know, if there's Latter-day Saints that happen upon this group, then hopefully that'll help find them and, and we are an ecumenical movement. So by joining groups like this, it allows us the opportunity to reach out to our fellow Christians and grow in the unity of Christ together. So we would ask that you would please pray for us as we are doing this, that if it is the Lord's will for us to join this organization, that everything will go through. Uh, Alan, one of the brothers on several of the councils that we have put together uh, will be actually on sitting as our representative with them. So we have a lot of exciting things going on as we move forward, as we are moving forward and we need your help. We need your prayers. We need your participation. As far as other prayer requests, we have some people who one brother in particular, he said he was struggling with some things and haven't heard back from him. So please pray for him. We have some other brothers and sisters that are struggling in various other things with illness, with um, other things they're going through in their lives. Please pray for them. Some need help financially. Some need help spiritually. Some need help health-wise. And we also, I've been talking to a lot of people who are just really excited about what we're doing. And I please pray and thank the Lord for these people. And let's not just more with those and more. We need to do that. We need to pray for those that need our help. But let's also rejoice with those that are rejoicing right now. Those that are coming to the fellowship and wanting to be a part of this movement and excited about it, really feeling the Holy Spirit moving them to be here. And with that, there is one other thing I like to say. When we're talking about building a temple, going back to that for a moment, one of the things that we're talking about is actually having a physical meeting like the Lord has asked us to do in the plates of brass three times a year. So one of the things that we're asking people to do, even if you're already on the mailing list, even if we already have some of your information, please go to cjccf.org slash join, or you can just go to the main website and then click on the join link up at the top of the menu. Fill out that form. We need to know if you're already in there, that's great. We'll check and make sure that all of the information we have is correct. But we need to see where people are, because if we're going to be traveling to meet, right now we're talking about potentially buying land in Michigan. But what if Michigan isn't the right place? It, it makes sense. There's a, an airport there that, you know, lands planes from all over the world. It's a, it's a major hub. So I can see why the Lord may be moving us in this direction. But we need to know, we want to build more than one temple. This isn't going to be like the flagstone temple. This is just going to be the first one to get this ball rolling. So if everything works out, we need to know where else do we need to build temples? Is there a better location for us to build temples? And 
I firmly believe that the, the three ways that we learn from the Lord are inspiration, revelation, and information. So as we're informed, we know what to pray for and what to pray about. Right now we're praying and asking the Lord, is Michigan the right place? But we also need to ask, you know, is there another place? Is, is there somewhere else we should build first? And if you want to know more about what we're planning, feel free to reach out to me. And if enough people do, then I can make a video talking about that. Right now, just know that we're looking to buy about five acres of land, preferably with a house on it, so we can use that as a place for people to stay as they're traveling. And we want to build a garden and a temple so that we can feed the people in that community, both physically and spiritually. That, that is the goal. And we want to do this in a sustainable way. So with that... If you'd like to take a moment to pray and sing a hymn, please pause the video to do so now. Now we're going to have the unity portion of our service for those that are new to these services. At this point, I'm going to read the Shema first in Hebrew and then in English. And then I'm going to pause for you to read it back to Together, I was going to say to me, but together is a more appropriate way of saying it. As we are united in Christ, as we as we say the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Yava Elohenu, Yava Echad. Hear, O Israel, Yava is our Elohim, Yava is unity. When I woke up this morning, I woke up with a start. The Lord was speaking to me, and I really wanted to go back to sleep, but I couldn't. The Lord just woke me up and told me what I was supposed to talk about today. And that is the four pillars of the fellowship. And when the Lord told me this, I mean, I was wide awake, and I just immediately thought, well, that's good for a Thursday thought. I'm not sure it's good for a Sunday message. So don't worry, Lord, I'll get to that. And the Lord was like, no, you will talk about this today. I was like, okay, okay, I, I will talk about this today. And so when I came down here to my office, I I had a scripture in my mind. The Lord didn't actually like give me a scripture, but I had a scripture in my mind, and it was this one in Ephesians. And I, I, I read that earlier, and it's what I'm going to talk about, but I'm going to talk about it in light of how the fellowship is organized. And to be quite frank, the Lord has me do these things sometimes, and I don't, I don't understand because in my mind we are not anywhere near ready for this. And the Lord has even told us we're not ready for this. I've received two revelations at least, talking about how we're supposed to start off as a council of fifty, and then as we get enough people in each quorum to actually be a quorum, then those can separate out from the council of fifty. So we can't have a quorum of seventy with only one seventy. We can't have a quorum of apostles. I guess we could have a small quorum of apostles with four apostles, but really, in my mind, you need at least six, if not 12. So how do we organize this once, it's, once, we, once we get there? What is it, what's the end goal that, that the Lord has us working towards? That's what I feel he wants, to talk, he wants me to share with you today in the message. And so that's what I'm going to talk about. And I can very easily just say this. There are four pillars, and I'm going to put a diagram up to show you what this looks like. In the first pillar, we have the first presidency. And in, in the first presidency, I feel the Lord telling me that we are to have five members of the first presidency. I know it's traditional to have three, but for whatever reason, I feel the Lord telling me that we need to have five. Once we have three, that will consist of a quorum. And we will separate out of the Council of 50 like we did previously when we had three. But the ultimate goal that the Lord is giving me is five. Then, in this column, working with the First Presidency is the Council of 50. And our role is that of leadership and facilitation. So, myself as the First Elder, and once we call another elect lady we would become the co-presidents of the Church of Jesus Christ and Christian Fellowship. And the other goal is the School of the Prophets, the other duty, I should say. 
So in this column, we have organization and education. And really, I've said this before, and I'll say it again, in my mind, we are facilitators. We're not dictators. And so because of that, that's why I say there's four pillars. It isn't a pyramid where under us are everybody else. It's more like next to us is the next group with, with their assignments and their callings. And the second pillar is that of the apostles. And just as the first presidency, you know, it's only going to be five of us, so we have a council of 50, the apostles, there's only going to be, once everything's, if everything ever gets properly organized, let me go back a second. There will be a first presidency for the Brotherhood of Christ and a first presidency for the Sisterhood of Christ. And so that is six people in the first presidency. And then for the fellowship itself, we'll have five people. So I guess in one way of looking at it, you could say that there's going to be more than five presidents. But when it comes to the actual fellowship itself, there's only one council of 50, and that's, that is... 25 men and 25 women that work for the order of the ministry, work, work with the order of the ministry in, in the school of the prophets. And, and then for the apostles, there's going to be 24 apostles, 12 for the brotherhood of Christ and 12 for the sisterhood of Christ. And out of that, six brothers and six sisters will form the form of 12 apostles for the fellowship of Christ. And, and that's in the order of ministry. And in the order of ministry, there will be 70 elders that will work with or work under, however you want to say that, these 12 apostles to do their work. And their work is outreach. It's uniting the saints as one. It's, it's, it's missionary work. They're the ones who really set the stage and, and do the initial outreach. And these 70 elders are there to assist them in this task. Then in the next column, we have the 70. And the 70, or we should say the Council of Seven, and they oversee the 70. And that's, there's, there's seven high priests in the Brotherhood of Christ and seven high priestesses in the Sisterhood of Christ. And, then, and from that are called the seven presidents. And there's either going to be three high priests and four high priestesses or four high priests and three high priestesses, depending on how this, this works. And I will tell you that it isn't by seniority. So once this council, once these, this council of seven is organized, they will vote and they'll say, the Brotherhood of Christ will vote and say, this, this is the president of the council of seven and the sisterhood, the, the council of seven, the sisterhood will vote. And they will say, this is our, our the president of the seven for the sisterhood. And those two will become the co-presidents of the 70 for the order of the ministry, for the fellowship, for the fellowship of Christ. And these have their own quorums of 70. And initially, as we grow, the goal is to first create the Council of Seven and then to create a Council of 70. But eventually, if we grow the way that the Lord desires, then each of the seven presidents will be the president of their own council of 70. And basically they take the work that the apostles are doing. Once they, they establish the, the mission fields, then the 70 are able to come in and, and basically take over that work and solidify and accomplish things because there's more of them. Uh, so they're, they're kind of like the glue, if you will, that, that holds the fellowship together. So while the first presidency and the 50 are focused on leadership and training and, and other things that to help the movement, the 70 are the ones that make sure everything is flowing correctly. They're the ones that, that, that go to the congregations and help them set up. And once established, then that gets taken over by the fourth pillar, which I'll get into in a moment. But still, if, if something needs to happen, the 70 are there to assist in, in the work. And that's why there's going to be so many of them. And the fourth pillar is the patriarch and matriarch in the council of evangelists or the, the high council. And their role, they're also a prophet and prophetess. They're revelators. 
they obviously receive patriarchal and matriarchal blessings for people. But looking at it from a uh, Brighamite perspective, you could see them as state presidents and area authorities, I guess. I think in the community of Christ, it would be like a mission president. And their role is a couple of things. One is when you have the congregations, once the, con once the congregations are formed, the 70s there to help them as far as coordinating with the larger fellowship. But within the boundaries of a stake, each congregation would send someone, an elder or high priest and another elder or high priest, teacher or priest or priestess or high priestess to be an evangelist to sit on that council. And they see to the needs of each congregation in, in groups of congregations, but they're also, they also oversee or, and they also oversee missionary work as evangelists. So the fourth column really has to do more with the congregational level. And that's why the 70 in that third pillar kind of hold things together. We have the first presidency, which is there to train at all levels, help put things together at all levels and, and help facilitate growth and as we move forward. Then you have the missionary work being done by the second pillar, apostles and the 70 elders. And then you have the congregational level and the stakes and areas over in the fourth pillar with the evangelists and the patriarchs and matriarchs. And then again, the 70 is that glue that holds it all together. They're kind of the in-between people between the breaking new ground and established ground. And all of that, I know it's, it's a lot and it's not even really relevant right now because we don't even have 50 people for a council of 50. But the Lord is telling me this morning that this is really important. I don't know if it's just important that you understand this, but I want to take this and tie it into the scripture in Ephesians so we can see why the Lord sees this as relevant to us today. He's calling us, as it says in verse 11, as apostles. So I'm an apostle as a first elder. I'm also a prophet. There are other people that are called apostles. We are special witnesses of Jesus Christ. And in a sense, the 70 are also apostles. They're not apostles as in like a quorum of apostles, but they are also special witnesses of Christ. Their, their goal, one of the things they're supposed to do as part of their challenge is to live to be worthy, to see Jesus Christ in the flesh and to gain that apostolic witness of Jesus. But the 70 are, in a sense, also a sort of evangelist. But really, in that fourth column is where you really have the true evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But we're really all pastors and teachers. So in a sense, this the, the, the titles in this almost become irrelevant because we, even though we all have our own specific duties, we're really all doing the same work of the Lord. And I feel like the titles, they're not anything prestigious. It's just more of the Lord needs us to understand these things so that if someone says, you know, this is my calling, we understand what it is that they actually do. And I, I do worry because you know, I've been doing this for several years now, and I see so many people who want a title. But in my mind, if you're not doing the work, the title really is 100% irrelevant. You can call yourself anything you want, but if you're not doing this work, you're not doing the work of that calling, of that title, then you, you don't have the calling. You're just, you know, the book of the law of the Lord calls it a usurper. You're just tossing a name, you know, before your name. It's like having an honorary doctorate. That doesn't mean you've actually earned a PhD. So then the question becomes, what is it that you're supposed to be doing if you have this calling? And, and currently, Alan and I, I'm, I'm writing up, and Alan's helping me, I'm writing up a series of blog posts, articles, that are covering each one of these things, one of the times so that everyone can get a better idea of what it is the Lord is asking people to do in this calling. 
Because one of the things that, that happens is we have someone come to us and they say, I feel called to, to, to do this thing, but I don't really know what it is. Oh, well, okay, well, soon we'll have this. Well, this if that's what you feel called to do, then that falls under this, this title. But really, all of us, what we're really being called to do, no matter what it is, is verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints, the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And if you look at our threefold mission, grow close to Jesus Christ as individuals and as a community, teaching and learning the Christian virtue of Ubuntu. And Ubuntu is an African term. It means, basically, it roughly means I am who I am because of who we are. Two, bring others to Jesus Christ into the fellowship or whatever branch of Christ's church they best fit in the spirit of Ubuntu. So that's the ecumenical movement, and it's also helping the spiritually homeless. Number three, fellowshipping together as Christ, worshiping Jesus Christ through God's word, sacrament, ministry, outreach, outreach, Kabbalah, and Jubilee. These are our goals. This is why the fellowship exists. This is our mission statement, if you will. And all of that ties into verse 12. What we're trying to do is perfect the saints. That is the work of the ministry, to edify the body of Christ. And verse 13 gives us a, a due date, if you will. Till all come in the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man or woman, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's a pretty big challenge. It'll happen when it happens, but until it does, we need to be there to teach our children. We don't have a children's program right now. The lady who recently said that she would, might be interested in, in helping with that, but we need people to put together a children's program. It shouldn't be just one person. We need a committee to do this. We need programs for families to help unite families. We need licensed counselors that can help people that are struggling in their marriages. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. There's a lot of people that need to be called so we can move forward. And, and I'm struggling. I'm doing the best that I can to get this, to get these things done. And people tell me I'm doing a good job for the most part. There are people that don't say that, but it doesn't really matter because I only have so much time in the day. So the more ministers we have, the more people that can be helped, even, even if, even if the Lord blessed my family financially to where I could, you know, retire from regular work and do this full time, or if people were, were donating enough money to where I could actually get paid to do this, I'm still only one person. And so you're only getting one perspective. And in my mind, that's not enough. Well, you're getting the perspective of the Holy Spirit on top of that in your own perspective. So I guess that's three. But I want you to hear from more people. I want you to hear from other perspectives than just mine. It makes it easier for us to learn. It makes it easier for us to grow. And I will tell you, I, I am trained to, to teach. I've been doing adult teaching for a couple of decades now. But I, I, I don't know anything about teaching children. I have seven kids and I do my best to teach them. And I kind of know it works for them because they're my kids. Uh, kind of around them quite a bit, but I am not an expert. I'm not really qualified to put together a program for children. And I have tried to do this, but I haven't had time. And I really genuinely believe the reason why I haven't had time is because the Lord's like, hey, look, we need somebody else to do this and not you. You get too technical. Um, so, so this is the point of what we're doing. We're trying to bring people together in Christ. We're trying to strengthen the family units, whether they be monogamous, polygamous, heterosexual, homosexual, or, or anything else. We don't define marriage for you, but we, however you define marriage, we want to help you grow in Christ as a family because the family really is. So the church is us individually, right? But Jesus says that where two or three gather in my name, there am I. So the first organization of the church always has to be the family. And we really mean that when we say that in the fellowship, because we encourage you to have a temple in your home, to have church in your home. Not just a little class, but actual worship of the Lord. If you have someone with the priesthood, 
bless them for taking the sacrament. If you have someone that is authorized, as the keys, however you want to say that, for temple rituals, I love seeing, or not seeing, but knowing that husband and wives are performing these rituals in their homes. It, it makes them sacred places. They, they are sacred places without them, don't get me wrong. At the same time, when we're doing these rituals, we're doing the works of the Lord in our homes. That is a, a special thing. It really is. When Christine and I have done these in our home, I felt the Spirit so strongly, and it is a true blessing. Why is this important? Why do we need these things? Verse 14 answers that question, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men. So there's two things here. I want to stop reading the verse there. We get tossed to and fro because, you know, say you're reading a book and you go, wow, you know, this makes sense. I get this. Then you read another book. Oh, okay, well, now I'm getting a new perspective. Well, now it's like, well, I'm reading both these books and these two things aren't together. You need another person to talk to to kind of figure these things out. And God is one of those people, obviously. At the same time, though, when we get together and talk as human beings, engaged speaking spirit to spirit with the Holy Spirit in our midst, our understanding grows exponentially. And so by coming together as Christians, we're able to not be tossed to and fro and get confused as to what, what we should and what we shouldn't be thinking, believing, doing. And, and, and when I say that, I want to be very clear. I don't mean that there is a, a list of beliefs that you have to follow. We're all figuring this out together. But it's good to know that there's a safe place we can go to figure this out and that you're not doing it alone. Carried about by every wind of doctrine. I, I really don't like talking like this because I feel like I'm just insulting the, the church that I grew up in. But it's the only church that I really know, so it's the one I'm going to have to go with. It always drove me crazy that once the president of the church would die, it's like, okay, well, we're going to throw this stuff out the window. You know, the, the best example in my mind is President Hinckley. I loved President Hinckley. He was, he was a good guy. I, I really, I and mean, he did some bad things, don't get me wrong. But his testimony of Christ was beautiful, and he did a lot, a lot to bring the Book of Mormon and the Gospel of Jesus Christ into the forefront of public conversation. That, that, that's a beautiful ministry. One of the things he did was he started this program, I Am a Mormon. Loved it. I'm a Mormon. Here's what I believe. Here's, here's what it means to me to be a Mormon. Well, he dies. That kind of goes out the window. All that stuff kind of kind of stops. They focus on building a what was it, a mall or something. And then that president dies. And, and the current president's like, hey, when you use the word Mormon, the devil wins. Literally just throwing out everything that the former prophet had said. I can go back further. We can talk about Adam God theory. We can talk about blood atonements and all these other things that, that, that were abandoned as different men took over the leadership of that particular church. And growing up in the church was very confusing. If I read whatever was placed in front of me by that church at that time, it told a completely different message than where they were getting the quotes from, from the journals and discourses and, and other places, from the previous leaders of that organization. And so I really struggled. I was like, how do I know it's true? How do I know? Like, does this mean that Brigham Young was a false prophet because we've abandoned the majority of the new doctrines that he brought in? I, I really wondered that. Now, some things make sense, you know. Okay, well, you got to stop plaguing me because you got a new revelation. But there was no revelation to start the black man, and they needed one to end it for some reason. I don't understand. But I just really felt like in that particular sect when I was there, like I was just constantly being tossed around doctrinally theologically. And I finally just got to the point where I was like, okay, well, this is how I have to see it. The scriptures are the doctrine, and whatever these people are telling me is the theology. The theology is going to change forever, but the doctrine is always what's true. And I had to stick to that pure doctrine. In the fellowship, it's a little bit easier because we don't tell you what to believe. We encourage you to share your beliefs with us so that we together can figure out what it is that the Lord is telling 
you personally, me personally, and so on and so forth. And by doing this, we have the freedom to grow on our own instead of being told what and how to think. And as someone who came from a church that, okay, you're supposed to think this. Oh, oh whoa, whoa, you're not supposed to think that anymore. You got to stop. We're doing this now. Get, get with the program. It, it's just a lot easier to feel safe and secure and also feel like you're not have to constantly worry about whether you're going to get in trouble for teaching apostasy. So because of this, we're not being constantly thrown about by every wind of doctrine. We're able to come to the Lord and come together in Christ and figure these things out and move growing in grace together. And then the final thing it says here, and the craftiness by the slight of men and the craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. There's two sides of this. There's the people who literally just lie in wait. They're like, okay, I can't wait to lie to you and give you anti-Mormon literature. I mean, I, I bore my testimony this week on James Strang and there's so many people that Without even watching the videos, just being like, he was a fraud and here's why. I'm like, um, half the things you're saying here aren't true. So there, there are these people that are literally lying about this prophet of God. And there's no difference in my mind between one group of Latter-day Saints lying about James Trang and non-Latter-day Saints lying about Joseph Smith. It's the exact same thing in my opinion. We need to be honest. We need to stop lying in wait to deceive. And at the same time, we also have the deceptions of Satan entering into our churches, saying things like that blacks should have the priesthood. And that wasn't just a Brigham Young thing. David Whitmer said it too. So you, you can't just get on the Brighamites for that. It was Joseph Smith III that actually said, no, I'm going to God for the answers. And he did. And he received the revelation. And the revelation said, ordain everyone that's worthy. I don't care what color their skin is. We need to have this, to have an organizational structure, to have these pillars in place, to help us avoid these types of deceptions. We need to be led by prophetic men and women who can go to the Lord. And when someone says, God doesn't like this, it's an abomination, these prophets and prophetesses can say, well, let me go to the Lord and pray on that. Let me see what the Lord has to say about it and come back like Joseph Smith III did with an actual revelation. Like Macmillan and Deasy came back with actual revelations. Like I went to the Lord and came back with an actual revelation. Like Christine went to the Lord and came back with an actual revelation. We are to be a prophetic people. The goal of School of the Prophets is literally in the name. I don't want everybody just following Dave. Dave, give us a revelation. I want all Latter-day Saints to be prophets, seers, and revelators, as if that's what they're called to be. Not everyone is going to be called with these prophetic gifts. But I want to make sure that those that are know how to use them and know that it's okay that they're safe to be an apostle, to be a prophet, to be a seer, to be a pastor, a teacher, and to use the spiritual gifts that they've been given. What's the point of having spiritual gifts if you're told, hey, we don't do that here? Sorry. So, with the message today, I would invite you to come into Christ and to come in fellowship with us, to learn with us, to grow with us, and to help build this movement together with us because this can only be built by working together in Christ. And I leave this message with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're now going to partake of the sacrament. I'm going to play a recording of myself reading our statement on communion. After which, Christine is going to offer both the prayer for the bread and the prayer for the water or wine. And then there'll be an opportunity for you to pause the video to partake of the Sacrament of Communion. And we will continue from that. At this time, we welcome all present to Christ's table. We invite all who would participate to do so as an expression of the peace and love of Jesus Christ, in whose name we worship. The Lord's Supper is a sacrament 
a time to focus on the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As disciples of Christ, we renew our covenants and recommit together to his mission, to grow closer to Jesus Christ as individuals and as a community, worshiping Jesus Christ through God's word, the sacrament, ministry, outreach, Kabbalah, and Jubilee. We encourage all that are worthy to receive communion to do so frequently and devoutly. O God, the Eternal Father, we ask Thee, in the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who partake of it, that they may eat in remembrance of the body of Thy Son, and witness unto Thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them the name of Thy Son, and always remember Him, and keep His commandments which He hath given them, that they may always have His Spirit to be with them. Amen. O God, the Eternal Father, we ask thee in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this wine to the souls of all those who drink of it, that they may do so in remembrance of the blood of thy Son, which was shed for them, that they may witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they do always remember him, that they may have his Spirit to be with them. Amen. I want to thank you for being with us today, sharing in communion with us, sharing in the Shema with us. And I wanted to just remind you one last time to please like and share the video if it helped you. And also to please be sure to go to the website cjccf.org slash join and, and fill out your information. You need to do, we, we're asking you to do this if you just want to be a member or if you want to be a part of the ministry so that we can reach out to you and see how we can do more together in Christ. I'm now going to go ahead and offer a closing prayer. Feel him should I, we bow our heads before thee at this time to thank you for your many blessings, to thank you for this opportunity that we've had to gather together in your name, to partake of the sacrament, to share in the Shema, and for the blessings that you provided for us as we continue to grow in fellowship in your name. We ask that you please bless all those that feel your spirit telling them to work with us in helping to build the temple, Please bless them with the financial resources that they need so that they can bless us with those financial with, with the financial resources that we need so that we can get this work done and move forward in your name, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. We ask that you please bless those that you have called to come and help with these services and building programs to help us raise our children in Christ and help us to strengthen our families in Christ. Please inspire them, encourage them to come and perform the works that you have called them to do. That we will have the tools that we need to provide for our families, to build congregations, and be the people that you, the prophetic people that you have called us to be. We thank you for all of your blessings. We thank you for the technology that you bless us with so that we're able to offer these services and we Pray these things to thee humbly. In the name of thy beloved Son, even Jesus Christ. Amen.